Halo is a game about shooting people in the face, and a TV show that makes you wish you'd done it to yourself. Now, luckily, I don't have to warn you about spoilers for this TV show, because nothing can ruin your enjoyment of it more than actually watching it. We start with the introduction to our main character, and no, it's not Master Chief. Instead, this is a teenager who wants to get high. No, I'm not joking, that's the plot. Because she finds the plant mushroom ball thing that she's actually looking for, separates out all the balls, and hands them out to her friends. And of course, they all swallow it, and she doesn't. Instead, she goes for a wander in the woods, finds an alien spacecraft, then goes back to her friends to tell them to all leave. But of course, they're all off their faces by this point. And then they all get shot in the face. Every single time one of her friends gets evaporated, I can only think, ah, you missed, mate. Because they run off as a group, and so because they're all off their face, they get picked off one by one while Quan survives, even though Quan is literally the cause of all of it. Within the first six minutes of the show, we've learned that the main character is completely insufferable, got all of her friends killed, and for some reason, we're supposed to have some kind of attachment to this person? But on the way back, she sets off a red flare to alert the village that, uh, people are about to attack you and you should probably do something about it. Unfortunately, that doesn't exactly seem to be their strong point. So the village mobilizes people on the walls, they hand out guns everywhere and close the gates. Except they seem to have been worried about another Alec Baldwin disaster because for some reason, none of their guns seem to actually fire bullets, it's just shooting blanks at the enemies. This is made even more obvious because the guy has a chain gun pointed at the gate. The aliens come through, he's firing his chain gun, there's loads of people with ARs, all shooting the bullets at him, it's just bouncing off the shields, it's doing nothing. These people are impossible to kill with their weaponry. And you should remember that, because the show doesn't. And because they don't care about getting shot, they just walk in calmly and blast everyone apart. And overall, the, the fight scene looks okay, the aliens look decent, the explosions and the effects are kind of standard TV fodder. Graphically, it's all fine, you have more of a problem with the plot. Like, it doesn't seem to matter what gun someone's using, it seems to matter who's holding it as to whether it can actually do anything to the aliens or not. Because it's a massacre, all the villagers are dying, and of course Quan here is hiding like a coward in a little basement doing nothing. She's got all of her friends killed, and now she's watching her friends and family in the village die as well. I have to say, she's really endearing herself to me with this action. Once again, they're driving around firing the chain gun, which is doing nothing to anyone. I might have found my thumbnail. Now this phase is because she's seen her dad get flipped over in a car and she's staring at him, doing nothing, and not going to help. The main character is a coward who gets all of their friends and family killed, and for some reason I'm supposed to feel empathy for this person. Her father is right outside the front door. She could run out of that door and save him, but instead she decides to go up top, up a ladder. And it gets worse. Because in the bunker she's leaving are all the elderly and the children, and uh, she doesn't care about those. She exits out the top of this building through this kind of vault safe door. And then she runs off and leaves the door open. This is a vault which has supposedly all of your defenseless innocent people in it, and she just leaves the door open for anyone to go inside it. I mean, admittedly, the enemies can get in there anyway, but at this point, she has no idea about that. It's been 10 minutes, and she got her entire friends killed, led the aliens back to her own village, and got all them killed, and then the innocent people who are the most vulnerable in her society, she's now left unguarded, unprotected, and just the door wide open for them all to be slaughtered, and she does not care in the least. So she runs through the city and everyone else is getting shot, and I just, at this point, I'm just hoping one of the aliens can aim. But of course, from the writer's point of view, they think they've got an incredibly strong, independent Type B running across the city, valiantly trying to save their father, even though it's ten foot in front of her, and she ran in the opposite direction. And of course we have to counter the strong independent type B with a man who's a coward, running to the vault with all the elderly and the vulnerable, begging for them to let him in the door. But don't worry, because an energy blade in the back will quickly sort that guy out. Yeah, take that patriarchy. Although he may have overegged his death scene a bit, it was more like his first time on stage at a Shakespearean production of Macbeth. That's how we get his O face. It's like he's still going, it's like, no, no, I still need to be on camera a few more seconds! And no, I'm not exaggerating, here it is. Seriously, did we need him on screen that long? Although I do like this kid's eyes, he's like, I knew I should have chosen Type B! This is the face of every Halo fan when they realized what the show was going to do to the lore. But this is Miss Plot Armor's father, and unlike her who doesn't care about the children, he's actually trying to save them. Unfortunately, his shoe is trapped under a van, and for some reason he doesn't just think of taking it off? I don't know. So instead, he watches the aliens open the vault, and in one single frame, shows more care and compassion for the village than his daughter has, the main character. 
for the entire show so far. Although his shoe might just be really uncomfortable, I'm not sure at this point. And so the Covenant opens the vault door and treats them with all the sympathy of Alec Baldwin. Unfortunately, Quan's not there. Again. She's still running around the village doing everything except run up to her father, which was why she left in the first place. Now, I'm no expert about getting my foot stuck under a car, but considering he's just watched an entire village be destroyed, for some reason, now he can get his foot free. I don't know, he just pulls it and it comes out from underneath the truck. If all he had to do to escape is pull, why didn't he do that in the first place? Do it before all of the children get Alec Baldwin, not afterwards. I mean, I suppose like daughter, like father. But either way, he gets angry, picks up his gun, which has done literally nothing to any of the aliens so far, like every other human weapon they've had in that entire village, and he just automatic fires into the guy's back, which obviously does nothing because not a single bullet has done anything this entire time. I mean, honestly, at this point, it's like Starship Troopers, where at the start of the movie, the guns do barely anything, and by the end of the movie, those same guns will take down an alien in three bullets. That's basically what we're about to see here. Because now, Master Chief has arrived, and he's got a gun which actually fires bullets. Now, for some reason, his visor will target identify two people on the left of his visor, and not the two people on the right, and I have no idea why probably read the script or something. But as you might be able to see, both the Covenant Elite and the Father are all marked for death. A Master Chief decides that it doesn't matter if I've got a gun, which has range, I'm just going to sprint towards the enemy for some reason. And because her father has the brain power of an amoeba, he's completely forgotten about the alien behind him, which has wiped out his entire village and all of his friends, and for some reason decides he's going to attack the Spartan. At this point, I realized that if I was his daughter, I would have left him under that truck as well. And do you remember when I said this part of Halo was a lot like Starship Troopers? Yeah, it's a lot like Starship Troopers. And after all that, the father is still pointing his gun at Master Chief rather than the Covenant alien. But they exchange these weird glances and they realize, actually, you're not that bad. Your guns actually shoot things at things. And then the other Spartans land, and from what I can work out in Elden Ring terms, it's one type A and two type Bs. We find out that the Covenant call Master Chief Demon, but if a guy was renowned for single-handedly wiping out massive amounts of my species, I'd try and come up with something a little more offensive myself. So Master Chief's going around and he's laid off three bullet bursts uh, with an assault rifle that presumably does serious damage with those three bullet bursts. We also live in a world in this where the pistol does more damage than his AR and everyone else's ARs do nothing, so I'm not really sure what actually controls the amount of damage that these guns do to the aliens. It really does seem to be about who holds the weapon rather than what the weapon is. And this is where we find out they've been watching their Doom movie, as we go into first-person shooter view of the series to try and get some desperate nostalgia from the games. You know those games. The games which the showrunner said he doesn't care about at all and completely ignores, and yet put in scenes in the TV show to try and cater to those people? You can't have it both ways, mate. Either you care about the games and you should faithfully stick to them, or you can try and get them to watch your show. You don't have both. Also, as any gamer will be able to pick up, this has some serious lag. He's got a crosshair visible on his own visor, and it doesn't even point where the gun does a lot of his time. He moves the gun and it lags behind awfully. Look, I know Halo Infinite had some problems, but it didn't lag this badly. But overall, this bit's the best part of the show. Master Chief fighting aliens. What a surprise, who would have thought that the Master Chief shooting aliens in the face would have been the best part of a Halo show, hey? Unfortunately, it's also the smallest part of the show, so you know, blink and you'll miss it. Because don't worry, later on we get to talk a lot about Miss Quan's fifis. After the fight, he pulls out his pistol to finish off the Covenant alien, and uh, firstly, that crosshair isn't where that gun's pointing. But also, watch the crosshair and watch the gun, because they're not attached in any way, shape, or form. In fact, if you watch that crosshair... It clearly moves around even though the pistol is not pointing at it, and if you think it was pointing there before, it's certainly not now. The daughter is still hiding behind a tire, hasn't helped her father at all, and screams a lot. This is the person you're supposed to get attached to during this scene, but don't worry because she runs off again. In one of the most ridiculous parts of the fight scene, especially considering that the villagers' weapons didn't do anything, 
This guy starts shooting one of the aliens with his gun. He fires a few bullets that bounce off the guy's shield. He puts his gun away and picks up a metal bar. And rather than taking range at the alien, decides to just start hitting it. And then he takes on a second alien with a metal stick. Honestly, if those villagers had known that their guns did nothing and all they had to do to defend themselves was pick up a stick, then uh, a lot of lives could have been saved this day. This is Quan looking scared again. I don't know what he thinks he's doing or why in this scene. It just seems like a, a waste of effort to pick him up off the ground. This guy is still firing his weapon, which has not done any damage to anything during the entire fight. We even see the bullets bouncing off the guy's shield. At this point, you'd think he'd just pick up a stick. This is a type B Spartan who's decided to go into battle with a pistol. Okay, two pistols. But don't worry because she's a strong type B and she don't need no pistols. Instead, she charges two of the elites and takes them down in hand-to-hand -hand combat. And honestly, I've not seen a fight this impressive since Wheel of Time, where the pregnant Type B took on six guys manually on her own as well. Apparently, her pistols do no damage to the Covenant aliens, but if you actually charge them and put them on the ground, suddenly the pistols work again. Although she does pick up one of their guns and use it against them, which I'm surprised we haven't seen before. <laughs> At this point, a lot of the Covenant have died and none of the humans have bothered to pick up their guns yet. <laughs> Quan is wrong. Running, still. And when I saw this Covenant come over the hill, I did briefly think that the show might be about to improve. Unfortunately, he decides to scream in the air rather than shoot her for some reason that I doubt we'll ever have an answer to. So she runs and she decides to hide in the kitchen. And in the distance, I can almost hear an angry Twitter thread being created. But the elite rips open the door to this van and rather than just ducking his head inside and going in the van, he decides to stick his head above the door and reach blindly into it after her for some reason. The guy would easily be able to fit through that doorway if he just ducked his head a bit. Unfortunately, the guy doesn't have a head anymore to test that theory. Possible thumbnail number two and three. As far as we've seen, that's the first shot that sniper has taken. Now, rather than go out the door, which she knows is safe because she literally saw the alien die in front of her, for some reason, she decides to go out the cat flap at the back. I have no idea why they've got a cat flap that big. And now Miss Quan decides to hide under a van. So she's been the cause of her friends dying, her entire village dying, has at no point tried to save anyone, help anyone, has just run away and hid while everybody else fights for her safety. What a wonderful character. Master Chief asks for Silver Team to clear the perimeter. The sniper takes this to mean run around the wall like a nutter for absolutely no reason whatsoever. Because they're getting shot at by someone with the aim of a stormtrooper, on a place where there's no cover. So they could either one shot the guy in the face with the sniper rifle or jump down for cover, but instead we're just going to run across in the open and hope he doesn't hit us or go through door number two fall off the wall. It turns out that go behind cover was a good option, it's just one that she had to be helped into accidentally because her own decision making skills don't actually reach to that kind of logic. Now I don't know what's going on here, but what you have is a type B cowering behind a wall with a sniper rifle that can one shot those enemies and instead hasn't even picked up the weapon and is just hiding, begging for help. I'm kind of surprised that they put this in the show, but I'm also surprised that an elite special forces team would have someone who doesn't even pick up their gun when they're under attack because she's got a choice between big massive heavy cannon or tiny pea shooter. Pea shooter it is. So she asks the Master Chief for covering fire largely because she just wants to sit behind a wall and not do anything for a while. So the Master Chief takes off in a jump where the trajectory, I'm pretty sure, breaks various laws of physics and decides to shoot at the aliens. Of course now, because the plot demands it, those bullets seem to do nothing again and they just tank it all while shooting him, which means he needs to take cover and you've got the audio from the game saying your shield's down and it's basically desperately preying on some kind of sense of nostalgia from the game players, while simultaneously everybody that actually has followed this show knows that he hates the game players, so I don't really know what they're trying to do here. I can understand scenes like this if you wanted to have the game players on your side, but if you wanted to do that, then um, probably shouldn't have insulted them and set up an entire alternate universe. But he has a plan. Now this is the chain gun, which Quan's father was using at the start. You remember that chain gun, the one that did absolutely nothing to any of the aliens for minutes at a time. Well, don't worry because Master Chief throws down his assault rifle, grabs that same chain gun and comes out blasting. And it completely shreds the aliens in a few bullets. This is what I mean about for some reason, Master Chief, when he picks up a gun, it does more damage. This is Starship Troopers all over again. Her father was hitting those with round after round after round. They were all pouring through the gate and it did nothing. 
But now the Master Chief's holding it, suddenly magically more powerful. I wouldn't mind, but this entire fight's only gone on for about five minutes. How could you have written this script and not remembered its own power levels? They're getting shredded by it, and if only it did this much damage five minutes ago, then this entire fort would have been perfectly safe, even without the Spartans. As it turns out, her father, still alive. Unfortunately, he sees the vault has been completely melted and thinks his daughter's there. Luckily, didn't last long. Unfortunately, uh, aliens just seen her as well. Possible thumb number four. So the father, in trying to protect his daughter, decides to fire the same gun which he's been shooting at aliens all this time, which has never done a single bit of damage to any of them. But maybe it might this time. Oh. But no, it's still doing nothing to the alien, even though the alien is damaged. I'd also like to point out that the father has a ranged weapon and is yet for some reason running into melee range with the deadly alien. This is a TV show based off a first person shooter, and yet this guy has not learned any of the tactics from said first person shooter. And so obviously the alien just bats the gun out of his hand and punishes him for the stupidity which seems to be running in the family. It was pretty cool how the sword kind of materialized in his hand though, I gotta be honest. Of course, now the Master Chief has shown up and he'd spotted the alien. So if only the father hadn't run at him and had just distracted him for three seconds, he'd still be alive now. And the dude takes care of business. So the father sacrificed himself for literally no reason at all ever and achieved nothing. You can get attached to characters which sacrifice themselves in some kind of noble or valiant effort, but when it's through their own stupidity, it's just kind of getting what they deserve. So the Master Chief reports back to base, 20 elite aliens killed, 150 civilians, no survivors. Oh no, it turns out there's one survivor. <laughs> Except none of them care about her or they just leave the village anyway. At this point, I really like the Spartans. And then we get the intro sequence, which is all about the Master Chief, because they know that the audience is only here for Master Chief. So I'd beg the question why Quan is clearly the main character. Quan looks upset about the loss of a village for about three seconds and then decides to leave. I mean, these aren't the first people she's got killed and I'm almost certain they won't be the last. And the Spartans go off in search of the landing site of the Covenant. In other places, the graphics of the ships looks really good, but in this shot, it looks more like an isometric RPG from 2003. Now, you know that chain gun which he threw his assault rifle down on the ground for to pick up? Master Chief never picked that back up again, no. Which is why now he's stuck with a pistol because he forgot his primary weapon back at the fight location. That is a really elite soldier. This actually prompts his teammates to give Master Chief his own weapon, and for some reason, no one asks what happened to that guy's AR in the first place. I've never been in the military, but I kind of think that losing your firearm might be a bit of a big deal. So Quan's following the Spartans because she needs someone else to leech off and probably get killed in the future. And Master Chief and a Type B decide to go into a cave underneath the spaceship to find out what the Covenant were doing in there in the first place. Turns out the Covenant were mining this cave to find some kind of item inside it and so likely would have just taken the item and left in their spaceship, without harming the village at all if Miss Quan and her friends hadn't come over here to get high, and then led them back to the village where her entire friends and family were. If you're ever getting chased by deadly aliens, not running back to where the women and children are is probably a good strategic idea. And so Master Chief discovers the magic triangle, and as you may have just gathered, uh, I know absolute butt-kiss about the entire Halo story, and so until the show tells me what the magic triangle is, magic triangle it shall remain. I mean, I was going to play through all the games and learn the story before the show came out for these reviews. But then I found out that the showrunner didn't give a damn about the actual lore, and I thought, hey, if they're not going to put them in the works, why should I? <laughs> this is a Covenant alien with his gun pointed at two Spartans and not firing, because the LEDs in the magic triangle light up. It's worth pointing out his partner sees the magic triangle light up, the entire base light up, and does nothing about it. No, she's just generally curious. Oh, look, there's lights everywhere. Oh, this is pretty. Even the alien seems pretty impressed. Then Master Chief gets some memories of him being a kid, but he doesn't know they're his memories. I don't know whose memories he thinks they are. It shouldn't take too much to put two and two together. And for some reason, at this point, Type B decides that now she should actually pull his arm off it. Not when it lit up. Not when the entire base lit up. For some reason, 10 seconds afterwards. It never explains why. But then the Covenant alien runs out. They chase him. He turns invisible, which seems like it would have been a benefit during the previous fight. Knocks Quan over. Honestly, most entertaining part of the show. And escapes into a little ship he's got hidden over the ridge. Well, she has a nice little sleep. So Master Chief tells the other three Spartans that they should take the alien spacecraft back to base. 
and he'll fly back with the device separately. And there's a bit of back and forth between Master Chief and a Type B who uh, says, you know, we should fly with you. It's not standard operating procedure and all this. And he's just like, no, I want to be on my own. That's an order. And just basically pulls rank and alphas it. So then we get the first glimpse of the UNSC headquarters with at its center stage, a phallic object only sort of rivaled by the white tower in the Wheel of Time. <laughs> I don't know what it is about these new breed of TV shows, but any time a woman leads an organization, suddenly the headquarters looks like that. <laughs> so then we get a scene of Halsey actually watching back Master Chief's video of the events that just happened, which we don't need to see because we just witnessed them. Of course, the show makes us sit through it all over again. Just this time interspersed with close-ups of her face for some reason. No, this entire scene is just obsessed with her face. Welcome to the leader of UNSC. She immediately opens with the fact that 150 dead people on that planet isn't a good look for the Spartans. Despite the fact that they were at war with those people, and so I don't know why she cares. Then Wolsey here brags that they saved one. Even though, if it wasn't for Master Chief picking up the magic triangle, they wouldn't have even saved that one. So, I'm not even sure why this is in the story. So they have a discussion about the magic triangle and how, you know, oh, if you'll tell us about the Covenant, then your funding won't go away. But then she says that Command on Earth want a friendly face to talk to the survivor. This is the same survivor that she didn't know existed until Halsey told her about 10 seconds earlier. But no one mentions that and Halsey just says, yeah, as long as I get the magic triangle, I don't care. Of course, then it turns out that Halsey's been conducting experiments, which he shouldn't have been doing in the first place. And she really needs to end this one. Stat. And then we tell Halsey she's a genius, because in every TV show, we always have to really affirm and tell everyone how much of a genius they are all of the time. Oh, you're conducting illegal experiments, but at least you're a genius. Uh, those two things don't balance each other out. And then she says she's put Halsey on a leash. And honestly, I think more people would watch the show if she actually had. So what is this experiment that she's not supposed to be doing, but definitely won't cancel, even though she's been warned that she definitely has to? It's a type B Tim the Tap Man. It turns out in this timeline, you can work out how to create humans, but not hair. Honestly, it's going to be me in a few years. Not as a type B though, probably. Hey, never say never. Welcome to High Charity. Location unknown, presumably because the writers haven't bothered to think about that yet. I don't fancy yours much, mate. Okay, dude, I really don't fancy yours much, mate. So the worm is talking to the back of a chair. No, I mean that literally, he's talking to the back of a chair. And he lets the chair know that while the item was exactly where you predicted, and we dug it out, and had every single possibility just to pick that up and fly away with it in our spaceship, for some reason, no one did and they let the Spartans get away with it. Just because that's what was needed to make an episode two. And it turns out that the back of a chair has a face. Although that face seems to be extremely covered up. Honestly, I've seen a lot of bad fashion in my time, and the other guy might be a worm, but for some reason, she's decided to dress up like a worm. Either that, or there's something severely wrong with a skeleton, and that's a 24-hour neck brace. And I mean, honestly, with expressions like that, personally, I'd just cover up the rest as well. But when she finds out that Master Chief can actually light up the magic triangle, she decides that she needs to talk to him personally but doesn't want to leave her book behind. No, this is the plot. And he's like, I hope you read to me the book. <sighs> oh no, the book is symbolic that actually she can't leave behind her human culture. And he realizes that, and it's all a deep metaphor and a back and forth between them without actually talking about the actual subject at hand. I know that's what they were going for. It's just a really awful way of doing it. Largely because I've just met this person and therefore don't care about them. They're talking in a foreign language, which means I have to read the text rather than focusing on either of the characters, which stops any form of attachment and also I can't get over this neck brace for some reason which is just distracting me from anything else altogether if you wanted to make an emotional scene you probably should have made that the centerpiece not everything else so the master chief brought Quan on board and didn't clean up her face which honestly I think is pretty funny he also locked her in her room funny mark too <laughs> Except now she's got to talk to Miranda Keys, and uh, the rest of the entire episode is downhill from here. <laughs> the stupid thing is, she opens with going, Oh yeah, we respected how your village stood up for themselves. And it's like, yeah, I always respect the people that I'm shooting my laser cannons at. Like, this is the person that they've chosen to get somebody on board through diplomacy, is it? This. I don't know where you learn that tactic to get people on side, but wherever it is, you should get a refund. So she pitches at Quan that basically if you say that the government blew apart your entire village and uh, so all the other colonies need to join us rather than fight against us, then it might actually help us unify and defeat the Covenant. And for some reason, this little child, which has run away from everything and been scared all the way, uh, flips for no reason. 
Uh, they've been taken away on a ship where they have no control over, locked in a room, and now she suddenly finds a spine when she's in a bigger position of weakness than she has been at any other point during the entire episode. I don't know what this is, but this is a trope which I see in show after show after show, where the moment a Type B gets captured and is in the inferior weak position, suddenly starts acting like they're in charge. I can only assume it's meant to make them seem powerful, when actually, it makes them seem like a complete moron, and as if they don't understand the situation that they're in. She isn't in control here. She doesn't have any power here, and acting like she does makes her seem completely and utterly insane. You have no leverage here. This exact scene happened in The Witcher and The Wheel of Time, and it doesn't make any sense to act like this. And she's like, what if I tell everyone that the UNSC wiped out my entire village? I'm like, well, you, you couldn't, because they're gonna record it, and if you say that, they just won't broadcast it to the world. At least think through your own plan. She gets right up in the camera's face. I'm the alpha here. I'm in charge. It's like, no, you're not just a scared child. You're also incredibly stupid. And she's like gulping and intimidated. And it, none of this makes any sense. This is literally the writers have suddenly decided that the scared little child, which got her entire village killed, is suddenly, for no reason, going to flip and be the big alpha woman. There has been absolutely no reason for this. She just went unconscious and is now an entirely different person. So if you thought I was being a little unfair with her during the entire first fight scene, it was simply because if any of that happened, None of this would have needed to, and it, we could have had a far better show. Like spitting the words into her face. Oh, the other colonies are gonna run away. No, because they just wouldn't broadcast the video. When you can only write characters as intelligent as yourself or lower, we need to be more picky about the writers that we choose for shows. Because they try and write scenes about negotiation, and they have no idea where to start. And that's how you end up with the UNSC just backing down and going, oh, what do you want? Like really, the negotiator folded like a deck chair. Almost immediately, just because somebody got in their face and spoke so said something to them, where the decent response was to laugh in her face. That I want independence for- Independence for who? You already got all of them killed. Then she immediately breaks down and cries. Like, does she not realize they've got cameras? So if she thinks she was putting on an act to act big and tough for the hologram, uh, they can also see this. <laughs> Meanwhile, Master Chief is staring at the magic triangle. We have a bit of a CW moment where lights start moving around in the shape of a human body and they start shouting out random scientific words, which you'll recognize, but probably will only have a vague understanding of what they mean in order to attempt to make them seem really intelligent. While at the same time, providing the audience with zero information about any of it. Yeah, apparently his lymphatics are ignited. And that's supposed to be really important for some reason. So Halsey contacts Master Chief and asks him if there's any variables in his neural lace metrics, by which she means, you're all right, bro. And that's when he admits that he's seen things and he starts to describe them, and they realize that he's having memories. Of course, he hasn't quite grasped that yet. At this point, I was kind of tempted to try and play spot the cameraman in his visor. But it turns out he's remembering his family, and, um, Halsey is a bit worried. She's like, yeah, maybe not touch the magic triangle. We, uh, we don't want you having any more visions. We kind of don't want a mad killing machine to remember what you did to his family. This is a really good scene, because if in the future, well, when in the future, Miss Kwan inevitably starts to beat up people, uh, just remember the difference in height, hey? Let's just use this as a sort of a measuring stick about how tiny she actually is when inevitably she turns into a killing machine. We all know it's coming because she is absolutely tiny. Nothing against tiny people, but it does put a bit of a roadblock in the transformation from scared little person running away from aliens to the inevitable when she starts beating up aliens and dominating all of them easily part of the story which I'd bet money on is going to happen at some point. So Master Chief realizes there's something wrong, so he, he runs uh, some medical scan on himself, and you do find out that under life support is a gas exchange, which probably exists in case he eats too many baked beans. So, uh, so we got this guy bringing some drinks into what looks like a kind of a medical research bay with lots of bits of chopped up aliens, because, uh, you know, nothing makes you more thirsty than being surrounded by corpses. And he's like, so I heard you had to play politician today with that girl. She's like, yeah, I sucked up my prize and gave it my best. It's like, no, you just sucked. But in typical fashion, she's like, well, Halsey's been putting roadblocks in the way of my promotion and I'm never going to get anywhere because of Halsey. It's like, have you considered it might be your fault? Because everything we've seen from you so far is that you're awful at everything you do. And he's like, yeah, well, you know, Halsey's single-minded works, the only thing that matters. Like, yeah, but have you ever considered that uh, if the woman ever actually achieved anything, she might actually get the promotion she's after? 
rather than just thinking she deserves it for some reason, even though she actually failed at the only thing we've seen her try so far. And he's like, it's nothing personal. No, it's based upon your performance, which so far has had a 100% failure rate. What you're actually moaning about now is literally not failing upwards. Now, admittedly, this show is written by entertainment industry scriptwriters who are used to failing upwards. So maybe that's just how they think the world always works. I'm not sure. But she says, I guess they're not going to give them independence. So what's the plan now? And he says, despite our best efforts, she succumbed to her injuries and she didn't survive the flight back. <gasps> you didn't order an Order 72? I don't know why they can't just say as an assassination. This is meant to be a military organization. Surely you've got the stomach to actually say it. And he comes back and he kind of gives the it's for the greater good argument to She's very annoyed. Meanwhile, I'm just sitting here grinning like a Cheshire cat. She got away with it in the first place, and now they're like, yeah, well, we've, f we've met you, and after meeting you and talking to you for 30 seconds, we want to kill you as well. And I'm like, yes, they agree with me. Honestly, at this point, UNSC, I'm all on your side. Let's get this done. I've heard the other reviews. I know what other people think. They say this show sucks, but if we can get this done, we can save it. We can actually save this show from disaster. All we have to do is get rid of the main character so that we can have Master Chief as the main character in his own show. And she tries to guilt trip the dude, but I think he's right. This is for the greater good, the good of the show. And if all it takes is to get rid of Quan, then that's a price I'm willing to pay. And then we get what might be the best scene of the entire episode. What is it you like? Nuts. He said it, not me. And then she asks him if he ever takes his helmet off. And of course the answer is no, not unless some hack writers get involved. And then she tries to guilt trip him because he apparently killed her mother, even though she doesn't seem to care about that for some reason. Uh, there's no preamble to this. It doesn't have any kind of impact or weight to it. It's just said and then they move on. It's particularly weird. But on top of all of that, I don't care if he killed her mother. I just want him to finish the job now. But they have a conversation about orders and how he thought his orders were weird that why would essentially a group of people blow up their own meeting. But he says that the people in charge of information, we don't. And she's like, well, how do you know that the people on the ground don't have the other way around? It's like, well, that's what communication is for. You can relay the information that you have to head command and then they tell you what to do. And she can try and guilt trip him over some kind of military chain of command. But at the end of the day, it's like that because it wins. And we've seen what happens when she makes decisions. All of her friends die, followed by her entire village and her father and everyone she ever cared about. And then she leaves them and doesn't seem to care about that at all. At this point, it happened, what, like 12 hours ago? And she's not bothered in the slightest. Also, I don't know why we've got transparent plasters. It's kind of gross. All in all, the longer this conversation goes on, the more annoying she gets. Master Chief has the patience of a saint. And she's like, oh, I don't look at pictures of my mom that often. No, you don't seem to care that much, to be honest. The order comes in, bearing in mind that they've just had a conversation where she's been completely and utterly insufferable. He's just had a conversation about how he follows orders, and now he's got the perfect order. If he was going to follow any order in his life, this is the one he should be following. But for some reason, he's uh, not sure that those are the same person. So he asks her name, which she confirms. You'd think that the next course of action would be obvious. At this point, I just want to follow the order and celebrate. And the only problem that I'd have is deciding which to do first. But Master Chief, he just walks off and decides to disable the security cameras instead. He had the perfect excuse to take out the most annoying person in the universe, and he decided not to. I don't know what that magic triangle did to you, but you need immediate medical attention because something's not right. Back at the suspiciously shaped Type B RAN headquarters, they suddenly realize that all of their CCTV to the ship has been lost. So now they have a discussion that he's having memories of himself as a child, even though he's a deadly killing machine, and that's probably not for the best. And then you decided to give him an assassination order. But Halsey is like, no, the Cortana system can help it. But they're like, no, we're not doing anything with the Cortana system. And quite frankly, from the backlash that I saw about the fans and how you changed the look of her, Keeping her out of episode 1 was probably for the best. I mean, they'll still be as angry when episode 2 rolls around, but you'll have lost half your viewers by then, so, you know, it'll be a smaller backlash, and you've got to take your wins where you get them with shows like this. And never have I ever been teased so many times in one episode. Like, we could get rid of the most annoying character in the entire universe, and there's been so many opportunities to do it, and none of them have worked. But we're still trying again, because now we're cutting the oxygen to the ship. I mean, I'd have accepted Master Chief going for some target practice, but apparently suffocation will do. But instead, Master Chief catches her because he's a gentleman all of a sudden. That is until they cut his oxygen as well to 40%, which makes him unconscious. 
supposedly. They cut his oxygen, and he immediately collapsed to the floor, without any hesitation. He's definitely unconscious, right? He's definitely unconscious. Definitely unconscious and not moving. For some reason, he gets up again, and it's not explained why. If you cut someone's oxygen supply, you should probably have them do whatever they need to as the oxygen is decreasing. Because once they've collapsed, they're not going to get back up. But no, we're going to do it in reverse, where someone completely collapses instantly and then recovers even though they've got no more oxygen. If his oxygen content isn't going up, why is he now more energetic than he was before? <laughs> but my favorite part of all of this is how easily their top master plan gets defeated. These people have complete and utter control of his ship to the point they can even fly it remotely. And yet he can defeat them by doing this. That's right, he ever so slightly moved a tiny lever. I don't know if the aim is to make the UNSC look completely and utterly incompetent, but that's what you're making them look like at every single opportunity. Master Chief isn't defeating them because he's superior or intelligent or has great plans. He has the ability to turn a tiny little lever, but she's worried that because he's moved a tiny lever to give himself oxygen again, that suddenly he's going to blast the entire headquarters away. So she decides to mobilize the entire army and blow his ship away first. And then we have a bit of type B on type B violence, where apparently just kind of offering a suggestion is questioning an order, and that means you're going to get demoted and attacked and all this kind of stuff, because the person at the chain of command is a complete lunatic, which, um, you know, th this is a bit of a weird stereotype, considering I thought this was what you were supposed to be fighting against. And yet in the Wheel of Time we had the same issue. Whenever there was an institution read by, led by type Bs, suddenly they started acting like insane lunatic dictators. And hey, I can make the same joke I made in the Wheel of Time as well. Maybe if you sat on your headquarters, you'd be a bit less angry, love. Now this is interesting because we get the Spartans putting their suits on. And uh, if you remember the trailer, we actually got to see each of the individual Spartans because they were so proud of the people inside the suits. Not this time, though. We don't get to see any of their faces at all. In fact, just as it's about to show their head, they cut away from it, deliberately, and only show it you when their helmet's on. But don't worry, it's not because they've changed their mind and are sticking to the law. They're just saving that to break it later on. Just out of interest, if you saw the three of these people walking at you down a corridor, uh, which one would you be most intimidated by? Just a thought. But Halsey has decided to throw her weight around, and she's in charge of the Spartans, and they'll follow her orders rather than the person in charge. And she says, no, you're actually going to bring in Master Chief without harming him. Probably largely because she wants to find out about the Magic Triangle, but it's not like she can tell her commanding officer that. They even go so far as to say, if any friendlies try to harm Master Chief, then they're not friendlies anymore and you should shoot them as well. At this point, I'm not really sure what the plan is considering you're in this headquarters and there's only three of you. You've just given them orders to go against the entire base. Kind of feels like you need a more complicated plan if your aim is to take on the entire base. And when I say the entire base, I mean there is a lot of them. No, really, there's a lot of them. Now, for some reason, the most annoying person in the entire universe has decided to get even more annoying by threatening Master Chief with his own rifle. The last thing she's aware of is that he saved her life from suffocating and she's decided to try and shoot him to pay him back for that for some reason. And she's like, I will kill you. I don't even understand why this is happening. She spent that entire first section running away from everybody. And she could have picked up any gun then and done anything. And she could, she was too scared to do it. But now all of a sudden she's Lara Croft and she's more than willing to take on an armored guy, which she saw take down every single alien that she was petrified of before and has also saved her life multiple times. Logical consistency and character development, not this show's strong point, but Chad Master Chief basically goes, ah, shoot me then, you're not gonna get through this armor, and then commits sacrilege. And at this point, the music's kicking in, everything's big and impressive and astounding, and this is a huge moment for the series, when to everyone else it's an abomination and should never have happened. Da -da -da -da! He's got a face, and he shouldn't do. The only response I wanted from her at this point is, ew, put it away. For some reason, she was going to shoot him before, but now he's got a face. She doesn't want to shoot him anymore. It's never explained why. He's like, if you want me dead, you'll have to aim up here. Her response should be, okay, bang. But that's, what, she wouldn't change her mind. What's even going on anymore? She doesn't even make a joke. You could be like, oh, I don't know how you fit those ears in that helmet. You could have said anything. They're like, what just happened? I think he took off his helmet. And they all look really shocked. Like, yes, because it's never happened in the games. And so it shouldn't have happened here either. And she's like, what are you doing? He tells her that if the ship lands, they'll execute her. And so she lowers the gun. And it's like, well, what did you think you were doing? 
doing before. This character is incapable of thinking two seconds in front of her immediate position. And she's like, what, they told you this and you decided to help me? And I'm like, yes, I can't believe it either, love. And I'm regretting every single second of this show. And then we get this. Why would a Spartan do that? I don't know. Nor do I. I don't care if the magic triangle has suddenly given you Fifi's. She's incredibly annoying. That should just be enough. But either way, she decides to lay down the battle rifle and give it back to him. And now it's his perfect opportunity to deal with the situation. <laughs> and as far as I see it, this is his last chance to redeem the entire episode. And he can tell he knows it. Instead, he kicks it back to her. And in that one second, the episode went to a one out of 10. Now, one of the Spartans has brought a sniper rifle to a situation that they know will at most be two meters away. <laughs> but they realize they need to get rid of the autopilot, so he tells her to go to a panel and pull out the cables. Now, she doesn't know what the FSS is. All she knows is cables. But for some reason, decides that those clearly done cables on the right-hand side aren't what he's talking about, and she decides to start pulling on those tube things for some reason. She's still pulling on the tube things, and apparently they're stuck. You've got a guy over there in power armor. Maybe it's a job for him. And the guy with the super strength tells her to work faster when she's saying, I'm physically incapable of pulling out these cables because they're too strong. This is like if she walks into a room with a jar she can't open, and rather than just opening it, you just start screaming that she should do it faster. I don't, I don't even know what it's supposed to help. But she realizes she's too weak to pull out the cables. And rather than asking Master Chief to do it for her because he's got super strength, she's got a plan. And her plan is as amazing as all of her other plans throughout the entire rest of the episode. If I was Master Chief and I saw her picking up a battle rifle, I would change my mind about what I decided before. But instead, she decides she's going to shoot the entire panel of electronics which she has no idea what it does. And he looks at her like, what on earth do you think you're doing? But apparently it works and he can pull out the AI chip and he gives her a nod of respect as if that was a good plan. No, it wasn't. That was a terrible idea in every single way possible. The correct thing to do in that situation was go, I'm too weak to pull out the cables, can you do it? When he's two meters away across the room. But when they realize he can fly away, they just shoot him. Don't know why they didn't do that before. Cause it's not like it blows up the ship. It just makes it crash. So now, every single military person in the entire headquarters is outside that ship with guns. And remember, those three people in the front have orders to shoot all of them if they try and harm Master Chief. I'm not quite sure what the plan is. Even if they were capable of doing it, I don't think they'd have the ammunition. <laughs> and if you can see, these people here, I believe, are the Spartans. And one of them brought a sniper rifle for that distance to the ship. Maybe if the showrunner had played the games, he'd understand which weapons should be used at which ranges. But for some reason, Master Chief has decided that he's going to use the magic triangle, even though he doesn't know what the magic triangle does, and there's no reason for him to actually go and touch it. And the three Spartans decide to go and point their weapons at the military, even though they haven't harmed Master Chief yet. And they turn around and look at the guns as if, why are you pointing at them? And rightly so. They haven't even made a move to harm Master Chief yet. What are you doing? <laughs> but don't worry, because he's now touched the magic triangle. Triangle starts doing magic triangle stuff. That may sound stupid, but that's all the detail we've got in the show. <laughs> oh, look, it's magic and glowing. And also, that's a thermal camera. They said that was thermal imaging. And for some reason, his metal suit is showing up. And unless that is a bright white light, which would mean it was incredibly hot, which should melt his hand or something. Like something should be happening if this is thermal imaging. Either way, he gets more memories of his childhood and it turns out he's already sketched a picture of the magic triangle, which he hadn't seen yet. Or that might be his father, I'm not really sure. And the magic triangle magically sends out an EMP and blasts all the energy while returning the energy to the ship. That was lucky. I mean, at this point, the most annoying person in the universe did say, what did you do? And no one knows, it's magic. And they fly off. And she's shaking her head in amazement. I can't believe you did that. It's like, it wasn't skill, dear. He literally got saved by a magic triangle that you haven't even explained or talked about yet. Congratulations on taking away any kind of stakes ever, because now you've already admitted that you're more than happy to just use magic BS to get all of the characters out of any problem at any point, because you can't think of a good reason to get them out of there in the first place. And that was it. A story about how everything goes wrong. Not only did you make the most insufferable and annoying character, which about 10 times you put her in a position where she should have died 
uh, almost magically escaped or somebody saved her. You even put out an assassination order for her and let her get out of that as well. And then she came back and tried to threaten the murderous killing machine and he still didn't do it. All because you don't want Master Chief to be the main character in his own show. Turns out you're also incapable of writing a secondary main character, which is actually likable. And on top of that, you seem to make every single character in the entire series incredibly stupid. You use the old trope of woman who's captured and suddenly starts acting as if she's the boss, and for some reason, all of the people who are actually in charge just fold around her because they can't think of a comeback to a scared little child who is acting up for some reason? Why did she run around whenever she was under threat at first, and then the moment she gets captured, suddenly grows a spine the instant she doesn't have any power in any situation at all. It doesn't make her look big, or clever, or smart, or alpha. It makes her look stupid because she can't understand the situation that she's in. And on top of that, the only time your main characters actually get put into a situation it looks like they can't escape from, it turns out they can't escape from that situation, so you're just going to make a magic reason for them to escape. And once you do that once, that's it for the rest of the series. At no point can there ever be any stakes anymore, because we can just think, oh, you'll just make something up. You could put them in any kind of cliffhanger position at the end of any episode, and we'll just assume that you'll make up some random nonsense to get them out of it on the next one. Because you've already proved that you'll do it in your very first episode. And while I know that the TV series breaks all the canon, and I knew that before, largely because you just admitted it that you didn't care about the canon in the first place, you then go and do things like you take his helmet off. Why? Because you think people can't get attached to the actors or something unless they see his face. Let's face it, that's less for the audience, more for the actor, because he wants his face to get known so he can have bigger parts in the first place. Honestly, I don't think building the entire central canon of your story around an actor's ego and his desire to get bigger roles in the future is a good decision for your business at all. What you should care about is the fan base and the canon that they actually want represented on the screen. Because you tried to pander to them, at least a little bit, you were showing the first-person perspective. There was various different sound cues from the game that you put in there for a bit of nostalgia. But they were just put in at the start to try and bait people in from what it sounds like because you didn't care about any of that afterwards. But even with me, someone who doesn't know the lore because I didn't want to put more effort in than the showrunner had, it's just an objectively awful show. Not just because of the things that I said while I was going through it, but because it was incredibly boring. The scenes at the start had a decent pace to it, and I think there were issues with the fight scene as it was, but for a TV show, I would have put up with it if you'd kept up that pace. But the moment that was over, nothing happened. And after the half hour mark, I started eating just through sheer boredom, and I wish I'd recorded it, to be honest, because I bit the inside of my cheek. Yes, that's right, I was so bored, my brain tried to chew through my own face. Presumably, just because it wanted to feel something so it could feel alive again. Then this will forever be a problem that you will get when you hire people who think they can break canon. Because talented people wouldn't want to do that. The fact that they're saying we want to just destroy canon because we're better than that, we don't want to be limited by the game, we're far superior to gaming. We are, after all, TV producers. We're the aristocracy. People who think like that will inevitably be awful at their jobs. That's the big red flag. People that don't even have the intelligence to understand why you should respect canon will inevitably be awful at everything else. That's why you could make a good show that broke canon. It's just if someone wants to break canon, they're not going to make a good show. But it's not like any of the streaming services seem to care. So this was episode one of... I don't even know how many episodes, and honestly, at this point, I don't want to think about it. But episode one should be your strongest episode. That's what you're trying to hook everyone in with. Because this isn't like Wheel of Time where they showed three to try and give a people a hook to actually get into the series. They thought this would be enough. And if this is your strongest opening episode, and it's downhill from here, where on earth are we going to end up? Quite frankly, I don't think it bears thinking about. And, uh... After spending all the time making this one, it's certainly not one I want to think about now, so I'm going to put it over to you. What are your thoughts? Let me know in the comments below. Like the video if you like the video. Subscribe more reviews like this in the future, and I will see you in the next one. Oh, bye bye